The McKinnon report is out and it said that Alberta needs to get its financial house in order. Hundreds of millions of dollars need to be cut to bring Alberta back into the black by the year 2023. Joining me now from Edmonton is Tyler Dawson, who's the Alberta correspondent for the National Post and our legislative reporter. Tyler, is the province really going to war with the public sector unions? It is certainly a possibility. The, the public sector unions are, are ready for it. Um, as you said, the McKinnon report lists a whole bunch of ways that that the province can get its finances back in order. And, and one of those is addressing public sector salaries from, you know, physicians to teachers, um, you know, your average bureaucrat who's, who's working in government offices, that sort of thing. And a whole bunch of those contracts actually come due next spring. So if there's going to be a fight over those salaries, um, it, it could begin within the next year quite easily. Now, we all kind of knew this was coming since Alberta was racking up a huge debt. The McKinnon panel said that Albertans' debt increased from 13 to $60 billion over the past four years and was on track to hit $100 billion? Yeah, it's been a remarkable increase. Um, and, and, the, and the thing that the McKinnon report really touches on is that Alberta's sort of debt situation and spending situation per capita has outpaced other provinces. So when you look at the amount of money spent per Albertan man, woman and child compared to British Columbia or Ontario or Quebec, um, we are spending quite a bit more than they are. And so that's sort of the foundational analysis that this makes. It says, well, look, we're spending a lot of money, but and it and it's, you know, our debt is less than Ontario's is, but per capita, we are out of whack with the rest of the country. So the idea is that if you can bring all of those numbers back down into something that sort of is more equitable to the rest of the country, um, we will save something to the order of $10 billion a year. Now, in all of the spending, it's not attributed so much to the NDP the last four years. I mean, this has been going on for about 10 years now, hasn't it? Yeah, it's it's a very long-term trend. Um, and that was one of the interesting things about this report, that you, you did kind of get the sense that if they had wanted to be super partisan and say, oh, it's all the NDP's fault, um, they probably could have. But this is a very, very long-term trend. And, and part of that is because you know, there's lots of spending during the boom years because we rely so heavily on resource revenues. Um, and then when, you know, the slump comes, uh, if, if spending isn't adjusted down accordingly, um, but, you know, sort of stays the same and then goes back up again, then that's how you end up in a situation where the spending's out of control. Did the McKinnon report also look at efficiencies with Alberta Health Services? Tyler, are we spending enough on health care in our province? Well, that, it's a good question. Um, it, it depends in many ways whether or not you believe that we are getting appropriate outcomes for our health spending. So our health spending is higher than other provinces. Um, and, you know, if we had the best health care in the country, maybe that wouldn't be a big deal. But the reality is that when you compare to British Columbia, Quebec and Ontario, which are the three provinces that the report sort of cherry picks from, shall we say, um, our, our outcomes are sort of right in the middle of the road or even worse in some cases. Um, a good example well, not a good example, but a very striking example is infant mortality, where Alberta has quite poor infant mortality rates and quite high suicide rates compared to the rest of the country. So these are, you know, very poor health outcomes, and, and we're spending a lot of money on it. Tyler, the federal government for the second time approved the Transmont Pipeline expansion, but wait, but wait still more legal challenges which may prevent shovels from going into the ground. This is exactly what Premier Kenny was afraid of. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, it was practically moments after the federal government greenlighted this earlier in the summer that, you know, a whole pile of new challenges were announced, 12 of them, I believe. Now, the federal court has said that it will look at six of them, and it is not relitigating a lot of the previous issues. Um, so it, it, if everyone recalls, when the federal court of appeal about this time last year put a stop to this thing, they sent the government back to look at marine life and indigenous consultations. Now, this challenge is going to have to be quite narrowly tailored to those things that the government was supposed to go back and redo. Um, so in that sense, it's not it's not re-looking at, you know, tons and tons of issues, but it is very narrowly tailored on these um, quite controversial parts of this. It is not at this moment, there's no stop work order, which is probably good news, that in theory could come later or may not, but no doubt this is going to be a long running legal battle. And, uh, you know, after even after the legal battle, there's still the sort of the direct action protests and things like that, that construction is going to have to contend with. And this probably is uh, probably a contentious election issue as well for the Liberals heading into October. 
Sure, yeah, the timing couldn't possibly be worse for them. Um, you know, I think they probably had a win coming into the summer. It, you know, it was a long time coming, and I'm not sure Albertans were super forgiving about it, but, you know, a couple months ago, they could have said, well, we went back and we did this again, we followed the rules, um, the project's going ahead, and we've done what we can. So so now they're sort of back in that position where they say, oh, well, the courts, it's back before the courts, and we have to work through that, and... Um, I, I don't envy uh, the Alberta Liberals who are still around who are going to have to defend this when they're out knocking on doors. The province's review committee on supervised consumption services recently made its way to Medicine Hat and Lethbridge. Uh, and it's going across the province right now, Tyler. The study will look at the negative impact economically and the social impact of these safe consumption sites, but it may not be looking at any of the positives. Yeah, so the government, when they announced this, basically said, look, we the positives have been studied. You know, you have long-term studies on Insight in Vancouver. Other jurisdictions have done this, so on and so forth. They said the thing that hasn't been analyzed is, you know, what's the effect on communities, on business, um, you know, sort of all the grievances that, that one hears when talking about this issue. The government is really going to be taking a close look on this. Now, they say that it hasn't been studied before. There, there have been a few studies one, actually, I think is probably the exact number out of Calgary on some of the crime statistics and things like that. But, but you know, the, the criticism of this is certainly that it is a study that is going to get them where they want to be. I mean, they have been critical of, say, supervised consumption sites, I should say. Um, and no doubt this report's going to come back with all sorts of, you know, nasty conclusions about the effects of it. How they decide to balance that with the the research that suggests it saves lives is, you know, that's that's a political problem for the future, I think. But uh, certainly the aggrieved neighbours and business people are going to certainly have their chance to to have their voices heard on this in the coming weeks and months. And this review panel is just basically it. It's just uh, digging up a lot of research and taking the feedback back to the province so they're not making any decisions with this panel here. Jason Kenney, like Doug Ford, has said that Alberta's open for business and a lot of the red tape will be eliminated. But Tyler, how is the red tape review looking? Well, it's one of the grand ironies of this in my mind that, you know, in order to cut red tape, you strike a panel to study the matter. It's sort of like that, that age-old government issue of uh, one thing leads to more and more red tape and more and more government. So there have been tons of submissions. Um, some red tape has been eliminated in sort of very small ways. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's the summer and the government's been out trying to get some of these reactions and things like that. So I suspect we will see more of the concrete steps taken when, when the legislature returns and when, uh, you know, when there's you know, people paying more attention to these things. And um, there's, there's a little more bang for your buck on those announcements when people are really looking closely at it. Now, there's been an overhaul on some boards, including university boards and human rights commissions. The UCP took out the NDP appointees and put their own people in place. Is this quite common? It is, yeah. This is sort of normal practice when a new government comes in is that you know, all these, you've got boards of governors that are full of people. As you mentioned, the human rights commissions, you know, there's education groups there's there's a whole whack of them that i couldn't hope to name off the top of my head um and yeah so the, the ucp came in and they basically fired fired everyone relieved everyone of their duties however one wants to phrase that that part of it i gather is not super common um the tendency sometimes is to let those contracts sort of run out and then replace people but there was sort of this mass firing and rehiring of um of some people who are very obvious ucp loyalists some of whom had been party donors which doesn't necessarily impugn their credentials. But, um, you know, it's, it's one of those sort of age-old things in politics that everyone does, so everyone's kind of okay with it. I think one could object, perhaps, to the idea that you have partisan stacking by a conservative government, by a new Democrat government, by a liberal government, what have you, on these things. But um, that is certainly what they've done, and they've got a whole new roster of people in place who will be sort of managing those quasi-government-affiliated boards over the next um, however long their terms are. School has started once again. For some parents, it's the most wonderful time of the year. But let's discuss school curriculums. A panel which includes an American school choice advocate and a person who runs an online philosophy school will be making suggestions on what essential skills students should learn. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting panel. Um, and as, as you pointed out, there's a couple characters on there who just struck some reporters, certainly as they came out of left field. And I actually phoned the government and I said, 
how did you come up with some of these names? I've never heard of these people. And uh, and they said, well, you know, we we hear things at events and names come up of people, and we there were a bunch of people who weren't available for it. But yeah, so the gist of it is they're going to be looking at what the curriculum should teach. And and this is this is again a common thing that governments do, especially conservative governments. We have seen that in Ontario. Um, you know, there was that huge fight years ago over discovery learning and math and things like that. And so this, uh, this what I would expect is going to come out with sort of a similar sort of thing and say, we need to get back to the the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and, um, you know, maybe learn a little bit of philosophy, depending on uh, how much influence our, uh, our our resident philosophy teacher has on this thing. Yeah, and get back to basics, man. Get rid of that discovery math. I know so many parents are just, it's a nightmare for them, right? How can they help their child? I mean, it's just it's so complex. Tyler, the government extended the curtailment of oil that can be produced and shipped to December 2020 to keep the price discounts low. Yes, indeed. This is, you know, we're coming up on almost a year of um, of this being a problem now. This, as people will recall, was a big issue sort of November, December 2018, when Alberta oil was selling at a massive, massive discount. Um, and that was basically because there was a huge backlog of, you know, warehouses practically full of full of barrels of oil and no way to get them out. Um, pipelines obviously being the simplest and the next on that list being rail. So part of this whole plan to bring prices back up was to restrict the amount of oil that could come out of the ground, thereby sort of, you know, lowering supply to bring demand up and prices. And I, I'm sure I botched that. And there's an economist somewhere banging his or her head against the wall. But but that's the general idea. And the government has sort of looked at the price situation and said, well, this, this needs to continue for this period. Um, and I do believe there is sort of a get out of jail clause where they can adjust it sort of at any time if if there's sort of a big change in in markets so as to sort of benefit everyone um, as much as possible. Tyler, I saw this recent tweet that kind of put a smile on my face. Natural Resources Minister Sohi was stuck in traffic as the train car was going by, but all of the oil tankers, and he's like, I can't believe this is terrible. I'm stuck again with a train. Isn't there a little irony there somewhere? <laughs> there is a little bit of irony there. It's you know, there's a, an oddly large backstory to this, which, in, and so that crossing is 50th Street that runs sort of right through Edmonton. Um, and it is sort of an objective nightmare of a crossing. There's sort of anywhere from half an hour to two hours of delays every single day on that crossing. It sort of depends when you get crossed or when you get caught in it and how long the trains are stopped for at any given moment. They average about four minutes where they're blocking that intersection and it goes up to about 15 um, and so the Liberals, part of one of their sort of big infrastructure announcements here in Edmonton was to, um, they're going to do a grade separation there basically to try and avoid this. But as you say, they seemed like they were probably oil tankers. Um, and I actually put in a phone call to Canadian Pacific Railway and said, can you guys confirm whether or not there's actually oil in this? Because, you know, it could be another chemical or something. And regrettably, they uh, they declined to throw fuel on the fire perhaps. So. But the, but the irony certainly um, did not go missed because former Premier Brad Wall of Saskatchewan said perhaps they're shipping irony instead and <laughs> Premier Jake Kenny pointed it out. So, you know, it's uh, there's a little bit of, so he's right, there's a little bit of everyone else's right, but it was, you know, just a, a microcosm of sort of federal versus right. provincial politics and transportation issues and pipeline politics all just sort of mashed into one uh, tweet that, got a lot of attention. Yeah. A story we recently had on BCN was how you can now have your auto insurance documents right on your phone for Alberta and now Ontario's jumping on board as well. How practical is this? It is a great question. If you're anything like me, your phone is on the verge of dying every time you're out and about. Um, and I think I would have to keep a paper copy in my uh, glove box anyways out of the chance that my phone would be dead when I tried to pull it up. So. I'm not sure it's super practical, to be honest, but, you know, Ontario went ahead with this um, on Thursday, I believe, as part of their, you know, putting drivers first stuff. It's, you know, it's a little bit of this red tape reduction thing that makes life a little bit easier maybe for people. And I mean, I don't even own a printer these days. I have to go somewhere to get my insurance printed if I need to print a temporary slip or something. So it, it makes life a little bit easier for some maybe, but uh, maybe it's only those very responsible adults that uh, always keep their phone at 100%. Alberta correspondent for the National Post and our legislative reporter, Tyler Dawson, joining me once again from Edmonton. Thanks so much, Tyler. Good to be back.